Hi, Doc. Thank you so much for coming on to the Stop Chasing Pain podcast. This is a, a huge honor for me, and I'm really excited to tap into your brain for about an hour. <laughs> well, thank you for inviting me, and let's go on a, a wonderful shared journey. Just lead me where you want to go. Absolutely. Well, you know, we've been talking for 10 minutes, and I was like, I better hit the record button because we're having so much fun. And I just discovered that you're a, a Jersey native, so we have that in common, which is great. Um, so we're going to talk about nervous system and vagus nerve and polyvagal today. Mm-hmm. People that have been following me know I talk about your work all the time. Mm-hmm. I teach a course on the vagus nerve and your work is a big highlight mm-hmm. in there. Um, so we can go down a lot of different places, but the one thing I figured I'd start with is I was actually reading one of your books this morning, which is one of my favorites. It's the pocket guide to the polyvagal theory. Um, and I love it because in that you have like a dedication to it in the beginning. And it says to the survivors of trauma who heroically search for safety. So I wanted to start off with what, what does trauma mean specifically yeah. for you? Okay. Um, we live in a world where everything seems to be defined external to the experience. So we talk about events. And so the word trauma is defined as functionally the events that people have uh, uh, experienced, yet they don't emphasize the experience. And if you are in a medical community, the word trauma often refers to being hit on the head, if you, you know, head trauma. Uh, trauma is our body's response. And so if we start to honor our body, in a sense, respect its own reactions, then we realize that some things that are trivial to us result in traumatic experiences for others, like shaming or teasing or a violation of trust, which we might find as being humorous, where you take someone for a ride and you say, would you go and get that? And you drive away. Those are, you know, since pranks, but they can be traumatic to people because they're violation of trust. And so what trauma really is, it's a violation of trust and it's a violation of feeling safe in our own bodies. So it's the personal experience that has to be emphasized. If we don't emphasize the personal experience, we start to uh, literally be dismissive of certain people's traumas. Wow, I'm gonna let that one sink in for a second. I mean, that's probably the best definition I've ever ever heard of it, uh, bringing in the word trust. Um, if you look at it from that standpoint, I mean, and in a way, I mean, I guess, I guess you can't be a human being on this earth without having some form of trauma, right? And it's just yeah. how you deal with it. Well, I, I often uh, say that we're a traumatized species, mm. you know, and, and, you know, this is who we are. It doesn't, it's not a, uh, let's say, a, a death warrant for who we are. It's not a limitation. It's what we have to start understanding and respecting our responses. Um, what I have learned really over the, over the past few decades, I've learned so much from those who have been traumatized, uh, or let's say the survivors of trauma and what they have taught me. And they've taught me what it is to be a human being, because what you end up learning from survivors is that they lose certain capacities. They have difficulty in feeling safe with others, uh, giving hugs, uh, literally feeling safe. But they never lose the desire to be safe, to be on that quest. And they start teaching you what it is to be a human. And what it is, is to connect with others to feel safe. So when you talk to survivors of, let's say, severe trauma, they will say, you know, what's your dream? My dream is literally to feel safe in the arms of another. And you say, well, what happens along that uh, journey to fulfilling that dream? And they say, my body reacts in terror or in threat when I'm in proximity with another. So we start learning that we basically have a mind of intentionality and a mind of our body, which is survival oriented. And they are not always congruent. And so we can't say, oh, there's nothing wrong with you. Let's go out and let's play. Uh, The... uh, cognitive mind, the intentionality mind said, yeah, that's a great idea. And then the person may take one step forward and suddenly get massive visceral changes and their body is saying, be cautious. So we have to learn 
to monitor and respect what our body's telling us. Then there's a second step, and this is where in, in the world of, is that it's whether we talk about mental pain or physical pain, there's a point in which we have to say that we can teach our body not to be so fearful, that we have to, in a sense, uh, it's almost like, when I say teach, it's not like we go through an argument. We have to really demonstrate that this isn't painful. So titration, and if you've had other people in the trauma world, they talk about pendulation or titration or resolution. What that is all about is allowing the nervous system to experience the changes from the predictable in short bursts until the nervous system becomes more accepting or accessible. When you retune a nervous system to be defensive, it is defensive. And that's the world that you have kind of like stepped into. And that is people's nervous systems are defensive. And then you see the profile. And the question is, how do you communicate with that nervous system for it to give up its defensiveness? And it's a tough, it's a tough, uh, let's say it's a, it's a tough road and a tough set of, of uh, strategies and arguments to, in a sense, Take the intentionality of saying, I want to be a social, happy, engaged person, co-regulate with other people. How do I get my nervous system, which is really telling me not to go near anything? How do I convince that nervous system that I can get close? And that's what therapies are all about. Yeah, I like that word convince and also how, you know, you say that people want to get to that destination. It's almost like they can see it. Yeah. But they're they're stuck in quicksand, and it's almost like the, the more they struggle to get out, the further yeah. they get pulled under. Yeah, I use the word falling into the abyss, hmm. and in a sense, they they literally are dissolving and disappearing because it's part of that very ancient defense system, which is to disappear, to immobilize, to appear not to be alive, and often when challenged, that's where their nervous system will go. I'm curious, Akif, uh, you know, what started to lead you down this journey of even wanting to look at the, the theory? I mean, we're, obviously, we're going to get into explaining the polyvagal theory, but yeah. what led you down this path in the first place? Well, it certainly wasn't trauma. And so mm. in the world of trauma, and I'm sure you know many of the leaders or have interviewed many of the leaders in trauma, they often have a trauma history. It becomes very close to them, very important to them. And they really want to, in a sense, from their own experiences, be helpful. I'm, uh, let's, I, I'm an outlier uh, because I wasn't in trauma. I was invited into the world of trauma. There's a different strategy here. I was a laboratory researcher. I did human research. I did animal research. And I did clinical research. And I was stuck on a problem. And the problem was in the neonatal intensive care unit that uh, you have a protective factor of baby's heart rate patterns when their heart rate has a nice respiratory rhythm, meaning that it has more vagal influences on the heart. But they also are prone, high-risk preterm babies are prone to bradycardia, rapid slowing of heart rate and cessation of breathing or apnea. So when you have a preterm baby, that's what they're looking for, apneas and bradycardias, slowing of the heart and stopping breathing. And that is also a vagal influence. So I was stuck with what I call the vagal paradox. How can the same circuit or the same nerve both be uh, lethal, but also a protector? Hmm. So how could it be both good and bad? And I was struggling with this. And um, I published a paper in a pediatric journal where I talked about this vagal activity as being protective. And a neonatologist wrote me a letter and he says, well, that's really interesting because when I was in medical school, I learned that the vagus could kill you, could stop the heart, the bradycardias and apneas. I understood what he meant, <clears throat> but he said, well, perhaps too much of a good thing is bad. And this is how we look at things when we look at things on the surface, that this nerve, when it's uh, in a more resilient state, is protective, but something can happen, it can get overwhelmed and it can shut you down. I didn't like that analogy. I didn't like the notion of too much is bad, too little is bad, you know, that you had just the Goldilocks phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, I decided that I would start to try to figure out why the preterm baby was prone to this and why were full-term babies less prone. And I started to look at uh, two sources of literature. I started to look at 
uh, basically developmental work, embryological work, autopsy research on the autonomic nervous system on the vagus. And there's interesting information showing that the vagus was myelinating during the last trimester and that this bradycardia was vulnerable in the period of time when the vagus had not yet myelinated. And then I started to look in a very unusual area. It's called comparative neuroanatomy. It's kind of, it's where people look at different species. They look at the autonomic nervous system or other parts of the nervous system. And what they're doing is making plausible guesses of evolution. And what I discovered was there was a difference between asocial reptiles or reptiles in general who are asocial and social mammals. And that was the, the social mammal, we, and other mammals have a different vagal pathway. We have a vagal pathway that is myelinated and it actually comes from a different area of the brainstem. It's linked with the area of the brainstem that controls our voice, our intonation of voice, our facial expression, and our ability even to extract uh, acoustic information from the environment. So we had a vagal circuit that was functionally linked to a social engagement system. And this was the linkage that enabled mammals to be social because they had this pathway that functionally turned off threat reactions. So this newer ventral vagus, as it's found more ventrally in the brainstem, was really the ability to turn off threat. And that became social behavior. So we are this amazing species as a wonderful innovation that we can be, in a sense, in a fight, flight, or mobilized threat response. And someone can come into our presence with cues of safety, like a prosodic voice, like a mother's lullaby. You can see this with babies and mothers. And suddenly the baby is calm, cooing. And we see this in our lives. If we're upset, if we have the appropriate social communication with another, our threat reactions are mitigated. We become very nice individuals as opposed to fighting, reactive, and yelling. Yeah, I mean, that's really powerful because, I mean, we're hardwired, right, to, to look at and notice the, the mouth, the face, the eyes, and pick yeah, up on these subtle cues. You're only hardwired for that when we're not in defensive states. So mm. this becomes the paradox. Right. Um, so we have to find a portal. So when the baby is crying, what is the portal? The portal is the intonation of voice, vocalizations. It gets through regardless of what the child's looking at. And you find this like there are in this world, I call the so, some people super co-regulators. They walk into a room, they have a, a beatific uh, facial expression, and their voices are so engaging and make you feel that they're there for you. So we know that there are, we know what we're reacting to is what I'm saying. And we just, in our culture, and then this is a, the culture that we all have lived in, which is not to emphasize how people speak, but to emphasize the words. So it becomes mm. not how I say things, but what I say. But our body doesn't really care what you say. It really cares about how you say things. And of course, you know, there are comedians who will basically, with a smile and a prosodic voice, really lay out a whole series of cursing and this thing. And you just kind of like laugh and smile with it. But if the face changed and the voice became yelling, your body would react to it in a very different way. Yeah, that's, that's really powerful. That's something I really gravitated towards your work. Uh, honestly, I'd like to unpack a little bit is that I, I really started to take note of in the beginning, the words that I chose to use, right? Because they're like a, they're like biological information, right? Yeah. Uh, so then I got to with a choose a word, but I began to after your work study. Okay, let me play around with how I say that word. Like mm -hmm. I was very blown away by changing the speed of it, the tone of it, the pace of it, and I could get a completely different reaction even from a word that was quote unquote, uh, you know, positive or or negative. Yeah. It, it was just astounding the difference. Yeah, uh, well, you can. I, I was doing a workshop and I asked. Um, basically, um, it was during uh, the 2016 president primary, not primary Republican. No, it was during 2016. It was one of the town hall meetings with the candidates, and I told my class to when they went home in the evening 
to turn the sound off. Mm. To now focus on the faces. And what we start finding out is that if people are talking only with the lower face, we feel like they're yelling at them, at us. But if their face has animation in the upper part, especially around the eye, we feel that we're being invited. So where you're emphasizing the sound of the words, I think that's critical, really critical. But the facial expressivity is also important. And what you start seeing is that people mm -hmm. who don't use the upper part of their face, it's as if that area is shrinking. You're not seeing anything around the eyes. But our eyes go to the eyes. That's our first look. Um, and if, if we're in a state of threat, our eyes have great difficulty going to the eyes. So if you look at eye gaze patterns in autistic individuals, they'll look anywhere other than the eyes. And if the, actually I've had kids in my uh, interventions and after the intervention, they look in the eyes because their physiological state has changed. Their autonomic state has now become calmer, more vagal regulation to the heart. So the, the, we're hardwired, I'm saying, but we're hardwired in a way that is mediated by the autonomic state we're in. So if we're calm and safe, your, your dictum of we're hardwired is exactly correct. If we move into a state of fight, flight, or defense, we become more primitive and those beautifully uh, nuanced hardwired circuits are not even available. Yeah. So I have a question. Um, I'm just thinking of how the majority, you know, social media has changed everything with how we communicate. Right. And I think that so much is lost because we see things that are written and we have no cues of, of the person saying it, of looking at that. And do you see that that's a big reason for a disconnect? And I'm just kind of my own extrapolation oh, here is that uh, there's just so much tension or anger or threat because nobody really knows what the, how the other person is saying it. You follow? I think, first of all, let's start. With, you're right. Let me start with that. The, okay, great. The, Check the win uh, box there. Okay. <laughs> let, let, let's now go beyond your right. And the answer is, if we go through the history of social communication, we talk about the telephone becomes the first one. And in the telephone, we took the face away from the voice. Mm -hmm. But the voice is quite powerful. And so people could, in a sense, intuit emotional state of the person they're speaking to. They would say, oh, something's wrong. Tell, tell me what's wrong. You, you sound a little uh, strange. Or, Did you have a bad day? Very frequently, people pick up on cues on the phone. And then with email, we strip the word from the voice. And those of us who were around when email just started realized the misunderstandings of the words. So when people used to write emails, and they would just be very terse, and then someone would write back and say, what are you angry at me about? Mm. So then people like me start at the end saying uh, best or best regards or, you know, say a nice word or opening your email and saying, good to hear from you. How are you? Something that kind of like tells you, tells the other person that you're there, that you're an accessible human being. But people used to, in a sense, lower, lower case and just kind of, or hopper case, which is now yelling, just type out the words and hit, hit send without any sense of responsibility mm -hmm. of what that would be doing. So we've learned to use these things. And then emojis have come on. And uh, we think that we can convey our emotions with, with a funny face. It may help a little. Um, but, you know, we, we tend to like a face-to-face -face or at least voice-to-voice -voice interaction. I received something interesting yesterday via email. I was invited to a conference, but the guy who invited me put on an eight-minute audio tape inviting me. <laughs> you know, so, 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 so there were his words. He said, I put this on. But when you listen to his words, you start picking up the sincerity and the really he wanted me to be a participant in the meeting. It made a big difference to me. Oh, yeah, that's powerful, right? Where you can mix that in there. And yeah. uh, I want to ask another question. It's 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 not coming from any kind of political way at all. I don't I don't want to go yeah. down that route. But, you know, now when you're with the masking that we're having yeah. to do in the world that we're in, you're, you're covering up a significant part yeah. of another human being's face. How might that even just from the vagal theory make a difference? OK, so initially it sounds bad, doesn't it? Initially, it sounds like you're yeah. 
taking away cues. And, you know, a lot of, especially people who suffer from medical traumas, what's part of feelings that they have, and that is the face of the person isn't with them. They're just seeing this mask. But there's a, uh, let's say, less negative aspect to that. The face is covering the bar bottom part of the face. The real cues of safety are from the upper part of the face, which are unmasked. Mm. And the interesting part is the lower part of the face has a dual purpose. It's not merely to, to vocalize and send cues that are positive. It's also an aggressive part of our, of our face. We bite, we chew, we yell. So it's double-edged. The point mm. I want to say is it's not great with a mask, but it's not as bad as one might think. And it really then puts more emphasis on upper part of the face. But what we learn, of course, is that in the world of chronic pain or the world of trauma, the upper parts of people's faces are non-expressive. They're flat. Mm. And that's, in a sense, a massive cue to you to tell you what physiological state they're in. They're in a state of defense. And when the face becomes more animated, more exuberant, uh, it's telling you that their autonomic state is now moved into more of this ventral vagal state, which is more regulated more resilient, more accessible, more engaging. Yeah, I mean, I find that a lot in my world because uh, people that come to see me have been in uh, chronic pain for a long, long period of time. Uh, and, and there has been physical and emotional trauma of some sort with, you know, 99.99% of them. And uh, they, they have that, I've noticed that they have that, that look to them. And it, yeah. early in my career was just about, okay, I mean, gathering the information, right? Because I figured mm -hmm. that that'll lead me to my diagnosis and it's a piece of it. But then I started to integrate a lot of the strategies that I learned from you in relationship to, you know, my relationship with that client and changing my tone or my words or how I go into things. And then it just started to like, um, kind of scratch that surface so they can start to peek out a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think what we need to start with is really how pain is related to defense because- Oh, that's pain, a good one. Can we go there? Yeah. That's a really well, big one. So, <laughs> uh, well, about a year ago, a year and a half ago, a group of uh, basically pain physicians and pain psychologists contacted me and told me they, uh, for some of them, they've given up surgery uh, for pain because they felt it didn't work and they felt that uh, adopting the uh, cues of the polyvagal theory were much more important. They were bringing people to pain-free states. And this was new to me because just like you know the world of trauma, I was invited into it. This is my invite into the world of chronic pain. Mm. And it took about uh, a few uh, meetings with this group. We meet every couple of weeks. Uh, and. Uh, they're from or actually around the country and some actually from Europe now um, and just talk about these things but and do presentations but the part that uh, really hit me was it was like something I had missed something in the decades of my own work I had missed that pain was a defense reaction and if pain is defense reaction what are the autonomic covariates or correlates of being in a state of pain and of course, it's re the removal of that calming ventral vagal circuit, and it's the stimulation of the sympathetic fight flight reactions. So you can see this happening. And one of my, uh, actually he's a friend and, and a colleague from another university uh, came on to this uh, kind of think tank group and presented his data on dealing with using biofeedback and the polyvagal theory to reduce uh, skeletal motor pain, and it's been very successful. And so it's really quite remarkable. And actually, last Wednesday, another colleague uh, talked about the management of chronic pain by utilizing the safe and sound protocol, which is this acoustic uh, intervention that I developed to stimulate the social engagement system. Now, it's not a standalone intervention. So he was bringing it in to his own clinical psychology practice of dealing with pain, but it was a journey with this uh, intervention to enable people to be more embodied, to understand their bodily responses. And he found that for some, they became pain-free and for others, they still had pain, but they could live with it. So it's like, you know, they were aware of the pain, but it was 
you know, a mild annoyance as opposed to uh, this, uh, basically uh, compromising their ability to function. So, so the, the important point here is start off by thinking that pain is, it's a body's defense. And that means that there are other aspects of a more generalized threat reaction occurring in the body. And that is this depression of the social engagement system uh, and the ventral vagus, this depression of accessibility as a human being. We can see that on the social level yeah. and this effect on the cues that the person in chronic pain is actually projecting or broadcasting to others. So if their faces aren't animated and, and let's say more have joyful and their voices are not prosodic, people withdraw from them. And in the world of chronic pain, what's the social life of those people? Yeah, yeah, pretty much non-existent or they don't know what their life is like without pain. Right, but the, the point, the first point is how do people respond to their pain? Uh, and and in general, people withdraw. Ah, uh, that's true, right? And so that takes away one of the most potent uh, mitigators of any form of threat or potentially pain, and that's social uh, communication or co-regulation with another. So there is this broadcasting to those who are there trying to help them stay away from me. Mm. And the co-regulation with another person is a potent way of shifting that mm -hmm. physiological state, moving it from a defense state to a much more accessible, calmer state. So how I know because we talk about that polyvagal theory, but so if you have someone who's in that state, how does someone who is who you know, was in their life or loves loves them or is going to take care of them begin to venture into? um getting in that circle well first let's let's talk about how difficult it is to get into that circle yeah so be, <laughs> yeah before before we try to encourage people to make that step great because what will happen is that their proximity their presence can be a trigger uh, in the person who's in a state of defense to be even aggressively defensive so the point is we have to understand uh, the reactivity of a person in a chronic state of threat. Second, we have to respect and acknowledge that we're human beings, that even though we may have great intentions, uh, we may be injured by expressing those intentions. So walking in that circle may be like saying, okay, we know we're going to get slapped. Should we react with an intentionality of vindictiveness if we get slapped, I don't mean slapped uh, physically, but slapped metaphorically. But the point is that if we venture into that circle with a person in a state of chronic threat, that person's accessibility to be co-regulatory, which is how we socially interact, like even, even in our dialogue on the internet, we're co-regulatory. We're role reversing, we're listening, we're talking, You know, we're going back and forth. A person in chronic pain or in a state of threat doesn't have that reciprocity. They're, they're just gonna be reactive. And so first we have to explain to the person trying to do good that doing good is not necessarily gonna be received. And you have to understand that that reaction is part of that person being in a threat state, not the intention to hurt you, but your reaction to, to the uh, threatened person's aggressiveness you have to temper it. You, you can't say, I'm using that now to say, uh, that person deserves it because look how they're treating me. You have to, in a sense, uh, be more compassionate. And this is where we move into concepts of compassion. And that is that we have to really respect the fact that someone's gonna be in a defensive state. And we have to respect the sense, our own self-compassion that we're going to get cues that are going to make our body feel marginalized at best. Uh, and potentially uh, injured, I mean, say aggressively uh, demonstrated at us. Yeah, that's big because you can go in trying to help someone, but then you're 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 going to kind of feel like you're getting attacked in the way yeah. by how they're coming at you, and then <clears throat> your first instinct at that standpoint may be to that, and then Absolutely. it kind of it just feeds. It's like the tsunami. 
Yeah, yeah. The, the point is we have to acknowledge that we're human beings. We're humans. And when there's a violation of our, let's say we engage with great mm. intention, and when that's violated, we have a bodily reaction. We have to acknowledge that and be aware of that. And that becomes the limitation of how we can be helpful to a person who's in this chronic state of defense. Yeah, so, the awareness is the key, right? I always say you can't change something until you become aware of it. The first step towards change is awareness. And I'd like to tap into that a little bit because when we first came on, you know, I, I find that a lot of people, one, really don't have any awareness of their body until something hurts or when they start to have this adversarial yeah. hate relationship with their body and sometimes even they're ashamed of their yeah. body well you know all you're talking about is contemporary society whether we talk about educational parent uh institutions parenting religious institutions political institutions it's all the same it's all saying basically reject what your body's telling you right from, exactly that's from, and and so we learn from an early age that if our body says we can't sit still we need to sit still um, you know, we, we if our, we have feelings of, let, let's say, even sexual feelings, we're told uh, not to acknowledge them, to start turning them off. Mm -hmm. And we start finding out that individuals, and this is in the world of trauma, who are chronically abused, are basically told not to feel, or in a sense, they're being subjugated into such horrendous situations that the adaptive reaction is not to feel. They become numb. They become dissociated. So functionally, our culture thrives on the level of making of that journey to success through dissociation from the body. I mean, if we want to think about it, we think about what is it to be successful? Success is always about acquisition, uh, resources, stuff. It's not described as really feeling integrated within your body, feeling at home inside yourself. And so we end up having this disparity where people are viewed as very successful, but then they're not successful because they haven't, in a sense, been embodied. They haven't been part of their own body and they feel something missing. And they also become vulnerable to illnesses because that dissociation, that numbness is a functionally changing the feedback loops between our brain and our visceral organs. So it's no surprise that people who have suffered through what we would call chronic stress or abuse or survived trauma, that they have comorbidities. And the comorbidities mm -hmm. are frequently uh, could be clustered under a, a category called dysautonomia. Our autonomic nervous system isn't working right. And when you have these features and you go to a physician, they don't know what to do because there's no drug, there's no surgery. Uh, so they're uh, basically categorized as medically unexplained symptoms, but they are really the nervous systems losing its ability to regulate the organs. And I'll actually bring you to another set of models. Um, our, we have nerves going to all our visceral organs. And in fact, the vagus goes to virtually all of them. And this is part of a bidirectional superhighway of neural communication between the brain and our visceral organs. And that's so our visceral organs are telling our brainstem, is this a calm, safe state? Or is this a state where we need to reorganize and uh, fight or flee? And the brainstem is now communicating with higher brain structures to say, if I need to run and fight, I'm turning off my higher cognitive structures. So uh, I can't do both. I can't be, in a sense, a super intellect and also a killing machine you know i have to or a defensive machine i can't do both so the nervous system is really a set of priorities or at least implements priorities and you also ask the question like our society is really uh, a threat-based society so we start asking questions in this threat-based society what's happening are people making good decisions and the answer is no not necessarily and then we're asking uh, questions, are they smart? Are they doing well in school? And you start seeing these compromises. So our society hasn't taken into account this bidirectionality between our brain and our body. And the, the story, a little narrative I like to say, is that uh, 
we have these nerves that are going to our organs and telling the brain whether they should reduce certain inputs or change these inputs. But as we place our peripheral nervous system under duress or stress or fight flight, those feedback loops are turned off or dampened. And now you start getting, uh, let's say, a neural deg degrading of neural regulation. And over time, you start getting end organ disorders. In medicine, we just look at the end organ. We right. start saying, uh, is this end organ diseased or do you have this pathology? We don't ask the question, what about the neural regulation of that end organ? because the medical community doesn't have a toolkit. The closest thing it has is with the heart and the vagal regulation of the heart. But virtually all the organs have both vagal and a sympathetic innervation, and they're affected by neurochemistry as well. So the organs are living in this uh, based upon the feedback loops. And if you disrupt those feedback loops, the organ then gets diseased. So when we talk about diseases of uh, modern society, they tend to be diseases of the autonomic nervous system, and they tend to be a product of the uh, inhibition of the appropriate neural regulation. And this is the is as both the beauty and the vulnerability of being a uh, a human, and that is the system is plastic and flexible and was evolved to go into these states of defense for relatively short periods of time. Uh, how short it could, you know, it doesn't, I mean, not necessarily minutes, it can even be hours, but it is always in the anticipation of recovery. Mm -hmm. Our society has not in a sense allowed or taught or created the windows of opportunity for recovery, which in general are social interaction, reciprocal play, I mean, even look at school systems, look what is taken out of the educational model, reciprocal interactions. And that's what the nervous system needs to take play out, as opposed to teaching kids, uh, enabling them to have reciprocal play, co-regulation, which will enable them to regulate their bodies and sit through tedious cognitive demands. Yeah, that's something I, I began to bring over into my world too, Doc, because when I have people that were in pain or injured, you know, you'd get them in through a uh, typical therapeutic or corrective exercise, which I dislike that word a lot, it implies something's broken. Uh, and sometimes they're, they're so regimented and they, they in and of themselves are a threat because people have so much anxiety about doing something the right way or the wrong way. And yeah. I started to implement more of a play feature two things. So they were getting what they needed without realizing they were getting it. It's yeah. kind of like putting the medication in the dog treat. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's what I call stealth interventions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, that's what I, when I developed the safe and sound protocol, that's what I thought I was doing. I was just giving them the sounds without any, any, any explanation of why it would do anything. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, you, know, you start seeing major changes in people, but bringing people into playful interaction is powerful. Yeah. And you know what? It's, 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 it's always fascinating me because it's sometimes in the world of medicine, they look at it like it's not serious enough. And because it's not serious, it won't work. There's this, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. Well, I think, so I started to talk about social behavior as being a neural modulator to mm. in a sense, give it a little more. Uh, cre uh, credibility or weight within the medical environment. Yeah. And when you study the phylogenetic shifts in the neural regulation of our physiology, you see that in the brain, the mechanisms or the structures involved in social interaction became intertwined with the neural regulation of our autonomic nervous system. So it's not uh, soft stuff. It's getting at the system that is creating, that has been disrupted, that creates many, or let's say, I would say probably a high, prob high uh, probability of the disorders, uh, high percentage of the disorders in contemporary society are autonomic. Yeah, and right, you say we're removing that play feature, first of all, from schools and early development, and then that's, uh, that's how you learn a lot of your social skills and your, what yeah. your boundaries are. Yeah, but what I've learned, we can talk about education, we can talk about medicine. You can't be too critical to the, on the critical of the physicians or the educators because they haven't been taught this. They're right. using the toolkits that they were taught. Mm. 
Mm. And in education, so when I talk to educators, I ask this one simple question. What would your job be like if you didn't have behavioral state regulation problems in your classroom? You get all these smiles in the, in, in, in the audience. And then you ask this question, how much were you taught about uh, state regulation or how to regulate the state of, your, of children? And the answer is nothing. They were taught behavioral technologies, uh, behavioral mod, but that doesn't work with certain types of behaviors, especially social behavior. So um, the issues, they, they are confronted with major problems without a toolkit. And then you have in medicine, where everything was going to evidence-based medicine and electronic records. And with electronic records, you start to break even more the social interaction between the physician and the patient. So the physician is looking at the laptop or the computer and not the patient. And so you start seeing this, this occurring as well. And the, the point is that uh, we have lost the importance and the role that social interaction plays both in education and in our healthcare. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Doc. Thanks for bringing that up. You, know, for, you, you don't know what you don't know, but then also you, uh, like in medicine, you know, you have so many constraints that you, you almost can't do what you want to do. You have five minutes with somebody and it's not enough time to establish. Yeah, what yeah you need. that was, that was the, actually, that was the point that slipped my mind. And that is once medicine became managed through what they call uh, MBAs as opposed to physicians, uh, everything was now under a clock because it was productivity. And medicine people, and so my, my, I have a lot of relationships in medical schools since I am still actually a faculty member in, in a medical school. The uh, point is they're very upset that they can't practice medicine the way they mm -hmm. want to. You know, they want to interact with their patients. They want to be the conveyor of healing, not the healer, but the conveying of healing to enable the patient to heal. And that becomes the other metaphor. Healing comes from the body itself. And all we can do is create the context that invites that uh, healing to come out. That healing process uh, has great difficulty in expressing itself when we're in a state of threat. Just so in a sense, uh, Late, uh, the duration of illness changes when we are, in a sense, under threat. Scarring changes or healing of wounds uh, from surgery if we are having good social support versus not having good social support. So actually, let's, let's fold back on your point. That is, social behavior is as valid a neural regulator as an implanted vagal nerve stimulator. So let's make mm. a strong statement that yeah. people so that social behavior is reaching into the neural regulation of the autonomic nervous system, probably in a more effective and efficient way of retuning it than using external electrical stimulators. Yeah, I love that. Right. So if people need it, they need it. But how, how about you partner the two together? Right. Right. So acute use of electrical stimulators or pharmaceuticals is a welcomed event. Chronic use is something different. So the question that invites is, can we retune? Can we do? And in polyvagal theory, I talked about neural exercises and neural exercise is really the empowerment of the nervous system to do its own regulation. So your point of, of pairing the two together is a good one, that we might need external stimulation to shift state, but then we need to get the nervous system on board in being the regulator. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, you were an early pioneer and an adopter in this field. I mean, what is it your thought of seeing the, um, you know, the explosion lately within the, the vagus nerve. It was kind of like nobody knew what fascia was. Now everything's fascia and now it's yeah. vagus. It's like the end thing. Well, I have mixed feelings because I think people misunderstand the message. They think that the vagus is a nerve and they go into a causal model. And that if this nerve is involved in the regulation and more stimulation of this is good. Mm -hmm. And the model really is that it's part of a regulatory system. And that is different than more is better. It's right. a regulation. And what's missing in the conceptualization is the concept of a feedback loop. And I realize that even within medicine, and especially in psychiatry, where it's very pharmaceutically oriented, feedback loops are not part of the story. They talk more in terms of deficits. Mm 
And so mm -hmm. we can talk about low vagal tone and using a stimulator to enhance it, but shouldn't our goal be to create a neural exercise that retunes the autonomic nervous system, takes it out of states of threat and makes it more resilient. And that's, that's my journey. My journey is to say, yeah, the vagus is important. It's been, it, it, when I looked at books from the, when I started doing work on vagal activity in the seventies, and when I looked at books on stress, it wasn't even in it. They didn't talk about the vagus or the parasympathetic nervous system. But if you start to understand stress from a neurobiological perspective, it's the retraction of that vagal influence that creates the platform for stress reactions to occur. So with that vagal system working, the body reacts to acute disruptions with the appropriate adjustments and calms itself down. We call that resilience. So from a psychological level, we say, well, you have people who are irritable and reactive, and we have people who are resilient. From an autonomic perspective, mm. you have the same story. You know, people who destabilize autonomic nervous system and people whose systems can be restabilized and have great range of function. Yeah, I like that. I mean, that's it's the classic yin and yang of resilience, yeah. you know, to be able to swing into one hang out there for a little while, as long yeah. as you need to, and then work your way back and then find yeah. this middle middle ground. But, but the point is in that you're honoring both the yin and the yang. You're, right. It's not like saying, so when, when I start being, let's say, uh, embraced by the trauma community, they start to think of the sympathetics as a mortal enemy. I said, you can't yeah. think of it that way. You think of it as it gives us energy, it's our exuberance. It just needs to be contained with cues of safety, meaning the ventral vagal circuit and the social engagement system have to be cohabitating with our sympathetics. And we call that play and we call that dance when we're older. What is dance? It's movement with social engagement. Mm. Of meaning voice and face and jet positive gestures. So it's play. Play is the communication of sociality with movement. And when people quote, can't play or are dangerous on the playground, the cues are their faces aren't working, they're not looking at other people and they become dangerous in that local environment. So the co-regulation is always underlying our interactions and play is really this amazing uh, opportunity to get this system going. Play is a neural exercise. Oh, I love that. I love the neural exercise part. And I'm so glad that you brought that up, Doc, because I started to see that as well, is that yeah. you, st you start to look at the sympathetic nervous system as the enemy. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and then we say, well, you know, I want to be an exuberant, happy person. Where's it going to come from? I'm going to just be a, a lump, you know, a blob, because I turn my sympathetics off. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the issue is, these are great systems that give us great life potential. And even, so the, the other part is we have this older vagal circuit, which is extremely important in regulating organs below the diaphragm. But when recruit in defense, it shuts us down. We pass out, we defecate. And the issue is this is system when it's, when it's uh, coupled with that social engagement system, so meaning uh, a, a kind intonated voice, Suddenly we see people's bodies conforming to each other. We're comfortable with each other. We can fall asleep with each other. We watch the baby with the mother. We call it shared moments of intimacy. We sit and hold someone's hand and we don't say a word, but our bodies are attuned. So we, call, we have all kinds of psychological metaphors, but neurophysiologically, it's an immobilization response that's coupled with a social engagement system. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I was very fascinated when I came across that, you know, that, that the freeze response. And, you know, I just started to notice that when I looked around it, because I live in the woods and I noticed that with other animals and uh, of humans doing that. And that was a the big awakening for me of that is a, um, a, sur uh, a survival response that's uh, not a bad response. Right. right? Well, the, the, and this took me a couple of decades to figure out because there's a, tra a, a trajectory. We think freeze is um, the immobilization response. Well, the real immobilization response, the ancient one is death fainting where the organism doesn't look like it's alive, like the mouse in the jaws of a cat. Mm. That's not what we're talking about when we say freeze. Freeze ha is having sufficient sympathetic tone 
to keep the body from passing out, mm. but still immobilizing. So it's a hybrid between that older vagal shutting down and mobilization response, but sufficient sympathetic activity to prevent a hypoxia, uh, lack of oxygen to the brain. Mm. I think that freeze is a kind of a developmental phenomenon that it, 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 at least in humans, so a lot of humans who have trauma history, uh, they get this and startled and freeze. You see that in the muscle tone and they just hold back. I think freezing for people with trauma histories might be, uh, be a sequelae of having totally shut down early in their life, meaning passed out, that the body went into this really overwhelming reaction, but it's potentially lethal. And then it since the body learned, don't go back there, but let's make a little modified reaction. Let's stay immobile, but let's now put some sufficient oxygen into your blood through the sympathetics. So I see freeze as an adapt adaptation of a critical immobilization defense system. Oh, I like that. I like that a lot. Um, I wanted to point something out before I move into the next question is that... Um, through looking at your work, uh, I change a lot of what I do when I'm physically manually assessing or working with a client. And early in my career, I used to be just focused on, okay, well, what tissues am I feeling and um, what could possibly be the issue? And now when I do that, all I'm looking at is the the person's face and their body language of how they're reacting just to me getting anywhere near an air. And here's the thing that blew me away, doc, is that people come on in and they know what hurts because they point to it. So let's say the right shoulder hurts. Okay. Well, I mean, that's an easy one, but what I noticed is that I would go to a different part of the area. I'm going to say arbitrarily the opposite side ankle. And I would see this threat response come over their body that they, don't, they didn't even know they were showing me. And that these cues started to say, that, okay, that is the nervous system telling me that something in this area may be contributing to what they're dealing with. You follow? Yeah. So, but you might even say, let's start off at a simpler level. Let's okay. say I'm looking at their face and I'm looking at their limbs and it looks like um, the coloration of their skin. You're looking at that first mm -hmm. and you may be asking your question, why is it so constricted? why you know and then you start realizing the the entire body's in a state of defense now where it gets manifest in terms of pain and injury is almost irrelevant i think that's almost your point that mm. that you can work anywhere in the body and you're sending cues of safety and if you send cues of safety the body should start becoming more relaxed more accessible and from a tissue perspective it's more compliant or softer or malleable. Uh, what we see with defense, and this is part, of, I think, of what you're saying, is we see people who are tightly wrapped. Yeah. And when they're, in a sense, high muscle tone, I mean, they're telling you right from the get-go, they're, they're in a state of threat. And the answer is, can you relax that? And in a sense, you know, I, I'm always reminded of my uh, my youth when I was uh, when I used when I ran in high school and the idea was I was a sprinter sprinters are a lot of muscle tension and we were well, they tried to teach me ineffectively to kind of relax the jaw you know it says let the jaw let those muscles relax and that's an interesting task if you're in a sense running trying to get that skeletal motor going while keeping the muscles of your face relax and that's part of the social engagement system it feeds back so it's the idea that you're constraining this to vents so i'm actually in fact i don't have to wonder because i'm already thinking that there are certain therapy models that focused on head movements alexander mm. uh feltenkrais these were in a sense dealing with these things uh they're not fascial you know, Rolfing went right at the structures or fascia, but they were going at, in a sense, uh, feedback into the cranial nerves mm. that send signals to the body to relax. So there are different ways of approaching things. I think we can be more neurally sophisticated. And that means that what we do isn't magic. We can approach it from different portals. And when we start mapping something like the social engagement system, it tells us exactly what afferent pathways will go into the brainstem area regulating the autonomic nervous system. And interestingly, many of the commercial devices that are out there 
to, in a sense, change autonomic state like vagal nerve stimulators are not actually stimulating the afferents of the vagus. Mm -hmm. They're stimulating the afferents of the trigeminal or the facial nerve. Mm -hmm. So like there's one thing, a device called the Monarch, that's trigeminal up there. And then there are the ear ones, and they're really tapping into the afferents for three different cranial nerves because they're going into the brainstem area that regulates the efferents, the motor pathways to the, of the vagus. So the neural stimulating models are very polyvagal informed, although they don't acknowledge that. The issue is they're going through afferents to get to a different neural pathway. So it's not like I'm stimulating trigeminal to stimulate the efferents of trigeminal. I'm stimulating trigeminal to get to the integrated uh, social engagement system. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just so glad you said that because that's something that I've, I've been teaching on my own and yeah. I do, I've been doing a lot of work with uh, it's just kind of like in the trenches, seeing this, how it worked, yeah. doing a lot of work with the other cranial nerves, yeah. noticing that feedback into that vagal system. It, it's just yeah. been profound. Well, it, it's, you know, again, the, the clues have been in, thrown at us from, from uh, our whole life. It's, it's <laughs> yeah. like oral, right. mo oral motor stimulation going through the trigeminal afferents that are going there as calming baby suck, swallow and breathe which is now dealing with laryngeal and pharyngeal as well. Mm. And um, the laryngeal and pharyngeal are vagal nerves themselves. So then even the notion of listening, the prosodic sounds are through a feedback loop that recruits the structures of the middle ear, which are facial and trigeminal nerves, and they're calming. And that's what my uh, acoustic vagal nerve stimulation model is all about. It's using uh, prosodic sounds mm. and through that feedback, calming the body oh i love it i love it that's so great um i i know we're getting close to the end here i just have one a uh, couple of things i wanted to ask you if you have the time um one concept that was really transformational for me now I, I wanted you to cover a little bit if you can was your your term of neuroception yeah and that i mean that was a game changer for for me in so many ways that would be a whole podcast in and of itself well the simple thing was i was stuck trying to find a word in which the nervous system uh, detected risk in the environment without awareness. And I started off with ideas that we perceive, but perception in, implies an awareness and a cognitive decision. And so we're not perceiving risk, we're functionally neurocepting uh, uh, risk. So I had to come up with this term that didn't deny that the process could be pretty high up in the cortex, but they were not in the realms of awareness. Again, we live in a world that thinks if the cortex is involved, it has to be aware, uh, awareness. And mm -hmm. so I needed a mechanism that shifted physiological states. And it became clear that our nervous system detected cues of safety and risk, and then appropriately or tried to appropriately adjust our physiological state. And the mechanism had to be a neural mechanism, had to be rapid, had to include certain, certain brain areas. So like, in the areas of the temporal cortex or near it, we detect features of familiarity of voice and face. Hmm. And so that detection, that's where I started with, with voice and face. And it just shifted physiological states. The actual mapping of those pathways of all of them, neuroception, is, will have to be someone else's research, uh, I say lifetime research. Yeah, that was a big one when I tied it to conscious versus subconscious, just about how much of our world that yeah. their brain deals with that we're not aware of, yeah. which is well, most of it. The 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 beauty of, of incorporating neuroception is really the uh, giving respect to the nervous system without uh, demeaning or minimizing uh or individuals because we tend to place so much emphasis on intentionality. Mm. And so we start blaming people. Why are you reacting to this threat cue when you know it's not a threat cue? So we now, uh, it can, or individuals, uh, it's like uh, they're a person who had been abducted. I've interviewed her and uh, discussed things. When she was abducted, she had a gut reaction to getting it, but she then overrode it. She said, this doesn't feel right. But she said, well, you know, I'm going to do this. She was held in captive for 19 years. Wow. This is a non-trivial event in which her neuroception 
was telling her something, but her cognitive brain said, to don't react to it. So we are in this dialogue of what is real and what is not real. And we, sometimes we need to say it's faulty and sometimes we need to go with it. But we need to acknowledge that it exists first. Neuroception is interesting because we tend not to be aware of what the cue is, but we mm -hmm. tend to always be aware of the bodily reaction. And in a sense, the real question now is when I get that body, not question, the challenges, when I get that bodily reaction, what do I do with it? Do I use right. it to create an argument with a person across the table with me who may have nothing to do with the cues? Uh, because the narrative is now trying to make meaning of that bodily reaction. And that you can be really messed up with. You may not be accurate. Yeah, I, I, it so fell in line with my whole brand. My brand is Stop Chasing Pain. And that means treat pain, but don't chase it. And I mean, you just kind of, you pull that all together for me. It's like a lot of times your, your cue is that pain, right? I yeah. mean, your, your reaction, excuse me, is that pain, but, and people huh. look at that as the, as the cue you follow, yeah. but it, yeah, that's but, what they struggle but, with. Yeah. But they don't know what's causing it. And, exactly. And they create, and this is like the world of quotes, uh, anxious people who say that, they're really not anxious. They're really reacting to the stress of the work environment. And the answer is you change the work environment, they'll find something else to be anxious about because their body is stuck in a state of threat. And that mm -hmm. is now creating their meaning in life, their narrative. And so the issue is if they went inside and honored their body response, felt it and didn't start labeling it, they may have a better, op better opportunities to adjust. Well, I couldn't pick a better way to end that one because that that's a big one right there. I think people should like I'm going to I'm going to date myself here. Rewind <laughs> this and listen to that part. Those are the whole thing a lot because I'm going to. But that one part, because that that's really, really big, because so many sometimes we tell people just put yourself in a different environment. And everything's going to be great. Yeah. Uh, and they fall back into those old habits. Doc, I. I I can't tell you how much of a great time we had. I mean, mm -hmm. I could speak with you for a year straight. No kidding. Uh, <laughs> I have other things to do, Perry. But yeah, thanks. I'm sure you do. <laughs> but, I'll take an hour by hour, right? Yeah. Well, but, thanks. So, what's what's for a remaining? What are you up to the remainder of this year and in the future? What, what do you got going on? Oh, I am well. First of all, continuing to do research documenting documenting that our physiological state functions as this mediator or intervening variable uh, affecting things like COVID. So if our, I, I did work like on with trauma and trauma becomes, if trauma retunes our autonomic nervous system into states of threat, our outcomes are poor. But if the traumatic experience doesn't retune it, our outcomes are good. So I'm trying to continue to test this notion that the retuning of our autonomic nervous system is what we should be looking at and not, in a sense, even uh, the injury. And this is the same thing mm -hmm. with COVID. So COVID uh, long haul is what we're seeing, everyone's seeing this. And the answer is the outcome is a function of whether the autonomic nervous system got retuned. So rather than, uh, it says getting the marker of what's going on in our body as a way. What I'm also working on is the fact that there is a co-variation between many uh, diagnosticable, diagnosticable uh, disorders and autonomic regulation. In fact, this autonomia tends to be one of the co comorbidities of many uh, diseases. And the question is whether it's truly part of the disease or is it our body's reaction to the disease? So in a sense, is it separatable? So if we get a disease, let's even say COVID, and we have this massive reaction and now the reaction stays and we call that long haul, is it still part of the pathogen? Probably not. And so the issue is like with pain, the same thing with pain and acute pain, where the body gets stuck into certain physiologically adaptive states of the acute injury, but now it becomes chronic. So how do you separate the two and how do you treat it? So in your world of stop chasing pain, it's saying, is the pain no longer a functional reaction to an injury? 
and it's now wired into your nervous system, but not the disease, not the mm. disorder. Can we separate the two and literally get that symptom out of there? And my strategy is you get the symptom out of there with cues of safety. Absolutely. Well, I, that bridges perfectly with the work that you're doing now with your uh, pain community. And yeah. that's one of the reasons that uh, I wanted to get you on this show, because I found that for myself by working with real people every day using your your techniques and parts of the, the theory. So once again, thank you very much. And do you have a moment to, to stay on after I sign off so we can get yeah. a nice picture together and I oh, can sure. share with the world? That'd be great. Sure. Awesome. Uh, Luis, I don't know if you have any questions. I don't. This was you a good? lot of amazing information. I just want to thank you again, Dr. Porges, for coming on. And just so you know, you spoke so much about the face and the eyes and the mouth and the tone and you just have such amazing energy. Your face is absolutely beautiful. It makes you very, if it makes you feel very at ease and very welcomed. And it's just really nice to see that, you know, you're doing what you're teaching too. So it's beautiful. Well, thank you very much. I would say that when, if I didn't, it would, my talks would never work. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're doing it perfectly. You're, you're, you, I could just look at you and you're a beautiful person. You could see how much amazingness there is inside of you. Thank you. Perfect. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. As I said before, go back, listen to the show multiple times and absolutely click the links that we're going to put on to Dr. Porges' work and, and all of his books as well. And as always, move more of yourself, more often, more ways, more environments from Stop Chasing Pain. We'll see you soon on the other side. Okay.